Good evening, everyone. It is uh, an absolute pleasure to uh, join this evening's very impressive gathering with the luminaries on stage and for the opportunity to, deli to deliver the inaugural Dr. N. R. Madhava Menon lecture. It's also a pleasure to do so on a day when we have just received the good news that the O.P. Jindal Global University has achieved the impressive recognition of being India's top law school under the internationally recognized QS rankings. As someone who has, as you've already heard, closely followed the meteoric growth of the Institute over the last decade and has been associated with many of their activities, at least 17 times that they've counted, I can say that this is indeed well-deserved praise and a recognition of the immense contribution and energy of not just the core leadership team behind this institution, particularly the founding vice chancellor, Professor Rajkumar. When I first met him at Harvard as a student, he was in an audience like this for a speech I was making. He came up and from that moment, I was extremely impressed with this young man. It didn't surprise me when within a decade or a little more than a decade, he had become India's youngest vice chancellor. I'm not sure you still hold that distinction after so many years of running Jindal, but, uh, but keep it up and uh, keep it up and let us, let us hope uh, you will go on to even greater strengths. Um, of course, uh, Raj will be the first to want to share this distinction and whatever praise I have given him with the impressive faculty, some of whom are represented on the stage, and the dynamic student body that has also helped the Institute to reach new heights. And of course, uh, we are honored to be offering our respects to the late Dr. N. R. Madhav Menon, who is widely considered to be the father of modern legal education in our country, and with very good reason. His was the voice that guided and animated many of India's finest legal education establishments, whether it was my own alma mater, Delhi University, where he taught to the law faculty, or at AMU, where he found himself at the beginning of his career, or his leading role behind two of our foremost national law schools, the National Law School of India in Bangalore and the National University of Judicial Sciences in Kolkata. And as the Member of Parliament for Tiruvananthapuram, just taking stock of the sheer magnitude of the contribution made by this distinguished Trivandrumite is both humbling and inspiring and can only hope to be worthy of this great figure in this inaugural lecture dedicated to his memory. The challenge is all the greater that I'm doing so in the presence of Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, uh, who's, uh, whom I actually crossed paths with without ever meeting many, many years ago when he was a Delhi High Court judge. Um, I received a copy of his landmark judgment in the M.F. Hussein case, uh, which I was so impressed by that I devoted two newspaper columns to it. And I would commend it all to you as a model of uh, a judicial pronouncement on the entire question of freedom of expression through art, uh, which makes some very profound points about freedom of speech uh, in ways that stretch constructively the interpretation of the reasonable restrictions mentioned in Article 19. And to my mind, that judgment uh, alone, he has done many, many other things, including in the Madras High Court and so on, but that judgment alone made him worthy uh, of his subsequent elevation, I believe late uh, in his distinguished career uh, to the Supreme Court of India. And it's a great honor to have you here, Justice Call, on this occasion. Now, the organizers have asked me to speak to you on law and the idea of India, and it's in many ways a fitting theme, given the current state of our nation. But what does the idea of India even mean? The phrase is actually Rabindranath Tagore's, and it is the idea of India is in some for, uh, form or another, arguably as old as antiquity itself, and numerous are the proofs for the, the aspirations of cultural unity that appear throughout the history of our civilization. I've written in my book, An Era of Darkness, that was mentioned a couple of minutes ago, about how the notion of Bharat Varsh and the Rig Veda, of a land stretching from the Himalayas to the seas, contained the original territorial idea of India, 
and how the travels of Adi Shankara at the cusp of the 10th century, establishing his mutts all over the country, and of course, uh, his presence can be traced to Srinagar, to Dwarka, Srinagar in the north, Dwarka in the west, Puri in the east, Shingeri in the south, and as we all know, there are stories of his presence in Assam as well. Uh, he helped knit together the spiritual idea of India within what Diana Eck, the Harvard scholar, has called its sacred geography. But lest some see this as a purely Hindu idea, one should not forget that Maulana Azad too has written of how Indian Muslims on the Hajj were all seen by their fellow Arab Muslims as Hindis. Whether they were Pashtuns from the Northwest or Tamils from the Southeast, they were seen as coming from a recognizable, distinct civilizational unity, that of Hind. So the idea of India as one civilization inhabiting a coherent territorial space and a shared history is timeless. But the idea of India as a modern nation, based on a certain conception of human rights and citizenship, vigorously backed by due process of law and equality before law, is a relatively recent and strikingly modern idea. Earlier conceptions of India drew from their, uh, drew their inspiration from mythology and theology, but the modern idea of India, despite the somewhat mystical influence of Tagore and the spiritual and moral influence of the Mahatma, Gandhiji, it's a robustly secular and legal construct based upon the vision and intellect of our founding fathers, notably in alphabetical order, Ambedkar, Nehru, and Patel. The preamble of the Constitution itself is the most eloquent elaboration of this vision. In its description of the defining traits of the Indian Republic, in its conception of justice, of liberty, of equality, and fraternity, it firmly proclaims that law will be the bedrock of the idea of India. To my mind, the role of constitutionalism in shaping the idea of India is the dominant strand in the broader story of the evolution and modernization of Indian society, especially over the last couple of centuries. Every society has an interdependent relation with the legal complex, and especially in our turbulent times, continuously and vociferously contested. It is through this interplay that communities become societies, societies become civilizations, and civilizations acquire a sense of national and historical character. It is no surprise then that while the ancient and medieval worlds largely celebrated kings and conquerors, since the age of the Enlightenment, many of the great people who changed the course of their nations and the world for good, and sometimes for the worse, have been lawyers. I just need to mention the name Dr. B. R. Ambedkar from his visiting card, MA, PhD, MSc, DSc, Barrister at Law, LLDD LL, list, to illustrate this point. The men and women for our founding fathers and mothers had the vision and the intellect to anticipate the problems and challenges that all civilizations in the modern era have had to confront and in the process they found in our constitution the best mechanism in the book of law to combat those plagues that afflicted our nation and to protect the interests of all people in equal measure. The story of humanity over the last hundred years or so has been the story of the spread of democracy, rapid industrialization and urbanization, increasingly accompanied by globalization of trade and commerce, and the increasing impact of science and technology on human society and culture. This diversity of challenges can only be addressed if we agree on the ground rules of how we disagree and negotiate change. Of course, some societies have confronted these challenges sooner and better. Others have delayed the hour of reckoning and their own peril. But India has somehow managed to muddle through with, with responding to this challenge in a, in a sense, in a, in a middling way. One could argue that uh, any truism about India can immediately be contradicted by another truism about India. Our country's national motto emblazoned on the governmental crest is satyameva jayate, truth alone triumphs. But the question remains, however, whose truth? It is a tr question to which there are at least a billion point three answers if the last consensus didn't undercount us again. And so we really do have to understand 
that if we were to look at the way in which the Constitution were to be written, we, 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 we could understand the, the logic of the British historian E.P. Thompson's wonderful utterance that India is perhaps the most important country for the future of the world. All the convergent influences of the world, he wrote, run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the West or the East that is not active in some Indian mind. And I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. But that, that, that does mean that the Indian mind, uh, and therefore indeed the idea of India, has been shaped by remarkably diverse forces. Ancient Hindu tradition, myth and scripture, the impact of Islam and Christianity, and two centuries of British colonial rule. The result is unique. Many observers have been astonished by India's survival as a pluralist state. But India could hardly have survived as anything else. Pluralism is a reality that emerges from the very nature of our country. It's a choice made inevitable by India's geography and reaffirmed by our history. And this means that the idea of India is itself very unusual in today's world. Because when you talk about it, sometimes reminds me of the possibly apocryphal story of the argument between two law professors about a practical problem. And one professor says to the other, you know, if we do this and this and this, we can solve it. And the second law professor says, yes, 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 that will work in practice, but will it work in theory? Indian nationhood works in practice. It, it doesn't terribly well work in theory because it's not based on language, a classic determinant of nationhood in many countries. We have at least uh, 23 in the Constitution, 35 Indian languages that the ethnolinguists tell us are spoken by more than a million people. Um, it's not based on geography because the natural geography of the Rig Veda, the Bharat Varsh idea, has been hacked by the partition of 1947. It's not based on ethnicity, because the Indian accommodates a diversity of racial types, in which many Indians have more in common with foreigners, so-called, than with other Indians. After all, Indian Punjabis and Bengalis have far more in common with Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, respectively, than they do with Punawalas and Bangaloreans, if you're looking purely in ethnic terms. And finally, if you take the fourth most common criterion for nationhood, it is not based on religion. I'm going to come back to that later. But we are home to every faith known to mankind. And Hinduism, a faith without a national organization, no established church or ecclesiastical hierarchy, no Hindu pope, no Hindu Mecca, not even a Hindu Sunday or Saturday or Friday, because all seven days of the week are equally good to devote to your divinity of choice. Hinduism exemplifies as much our diversity as it does a common cultural heritage. So Indian nationalism has to be the nationalism of an idea. The idea, if I can borrow from Peter Pan, of an ever, ever land emerging from an ancient civilization, united by a shared history, sustained by pluralist democracy and under the rule of law. Now, this land imposes no narrow conformities on its citizens. The whole idea of India is that you can be many things and one thing. You can be a good Muslim, a good Keralite, and a good Indian all at once. I had the misfortune in many ways for many years of leading the UN team dealing with the civil war in the former Yugoslavia. And there we were told of what Freudians talked about, the, um, the narcissism of minor differences as people all descended from the same Slavic settlers who settled the Balkans in the seventh century, separated by history and therefore variants of religion, were tearing each other apart in the most grotesque ways, even though they were essentially the same people. The narcissism of minor differences. In India, our constitution enables us to celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are to stand Michael Ignatieff's famous phrase on its head, a land of belonging rather than of blood. So the idea of India is of one land embracing many. It is the idea that a nation may endure differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, consonant, costume, and custom, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is a democratic consensus on the simple principle that in a democracy under rule of law, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. The reason India has survived all the stresses and strains 
that have beset it for nearly 70 years and that led so many to predict its imminent disintegration is that it maintained consensus on how to manage without consensus. Today, some in positions of power seem to be questioning those ground rules, and that is why it is all the more essential to reaffirm them before you today. Now, what knits this entire idea of India together is, of course, the rule of law as enshrined in our Constitution. Jawaharlal Nehru's opening remarks when he moved the motion at the newly established Constituent Assembly on 13th December 1946 gives us a view of the immense pressure and responsibility on the lawmakers to ensure that they responded fittingly to the situation and did justice to the task of constitution making. They had to preserve the past idea of India and march towards the future idea of India. So Nehruji said, and I quote, we are at the end of an era and possibly very soon we shall embark upon a new age. And my mind goes back to the great past of India, to the 5,000 years of India's history, from the very dawn of that history, which might be considered almost the dawn of human history, till today. All that past crowds around me and exhilarates me and at the same time somewhat oppresses me. Am I worthy of that past? When I think also of the future, the greater future, I hope, standing on the sword's edge of the present between this mightier past and the between this mighty past and the mightier future i tremble a little and feel overwhelmed by this task we have come here says neroji we have come here at a strange moment in india's history i do not know but i do feel that there is some magic in this moment of transition from the old to the new Something of that magic which one sees when the night turns into day. And even though the day may be a cloudy one, it is day after all. For when the clouds move away, we can see the sun later on. We are perhaps once again at a strange moment in India's history. But if we, if we stay in the hope of those clouds moving away from, from, from the sun, we should also recall Dr. Ambedkar's concluding remarks to the same Constituent Assembly on 25 November 1949 in his famous Grammar of Anarchy speech. He informed the Assembly of the maladies of India and the ideal idea of India to be ensured by the rule of law in a magisterial expression of India through the prism of politics, law, and social hierarchy. He said, quote, I'm quoting Dr. Ambedkar, in politics we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reasons of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions? Ambedkar's eloquent assault on discrimination and untouchability, for the first time cogently expanded the idea of India to incorporate the nation's vast neglected underclass. The working in, in, the instrument of our democracy then became the constitution, the basic framework of our democracy, framework, the three branches, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, the constitution defines their powers, delimits their jurisdictions, demarcates their responsibilities, and regulates their relationships with one another and with the people. But the most important contribution of the Constitution to the idea of India was that of representation centered on individuals. As young Madhav Khosla explains in his brilliant new book, India's Founding Moment, the political apparatus of establishing a constitutional democracy in post-colonial India, a land that was poor and illiterate, divided by caste, religion, and languages, and burdened by centuries of tradition, involved an attempt to free Indians from prevailing types of knowledge and understanding, to place citizens in a realm of individual agency and deliberation that was appropriate to self-rule, and to alter the relationship that they shared with one another. As Dr. Ambedkar recognized, the founders of the Republic chose to impose a liberal constitution upon a society that was illiberal. They saw the principles of liberal constitutionalism, the centrality of the state, non-communal political representation, and so on, as responsive to the challenges posed by the burden of democracy. They committed India to a common language of the rule of law, 
constructed a centralized state and rejected localism, and they instituted a model of representation whose units were individuals rather than groups. The idea very much of India had to be nurtured through the individual Indian citizen. Constitutions are, of course, and Ambedkar explicitly made this point, tools to control and restrain state power. The challenge lies in reconciling restrictions on state power with popular rule. To prevent temporary majorities, since all majorities are by definition temporary, something that some people tend to forget nowadays, from completely undoing what the Constitution has provided. Khosla suggests that the founders of the Indian Republic specifically held a conception of democracy that went beyond majority rule and rejected in Dworkin's notable phrase, the majoritarian premise. They subordinated politics to law, and Ambedkar himself said, and I'm quoting Dr. Ambedkar, the rights of Indian citizens cannot be taken away by any legislature merely because it happens to have a majority. The struggle for Indian independence was, after all, not merely a struggle for freedom from alien rule. It was a shift away from the administration of law and order as instruments of imperialist despotism. Thus was born the idea of constitutional morality, meaning the commitment to constitutional means, to its processes and structures, alongside a commitment to free speech, scrutiny of public action, and legal limitations on the exercise of power. That was how the freedoms of Indians were meant to flourish under the Constitution. Of course, Dr. Ambedkar realized, and he said this, that it's perfectly possible to pervert the Constitution without changing its form by merely changing the form of the administration of it in order to make it opposed to the spirit of the Constitution. Ambedkar argued that constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. And he said, we must realize that our people are yet to learn it. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic, unquote. So he insisted that the directive principles, an unusual feature of the Indian constitution not found elsewhere, were necessary because though the rules of democracy mandated that the people would elect those who hold power, the principles confirmed, and I quote Dr. Ambedkar again, that whoever captures power will not be free to do what he likes with it, unquote. I, I'm sorry to be saying things that should be obvious and probably are obvious to the legal minds in this room, but are not often obvious to those exercising power, and that's why it's important for them to be aware of this, to be reminded of this. And at the same time, the Constitution wanted Indians to have a new understanding of authority. They would be liberated through submission to an impersonal force of law that saw them as equal agents, and that liberated spirit would make possible socio-economic transformation. This was important because the leaders like Nehru, whose vision of democracy included not just equality, but also a decent standard of living for all, the establishment of a free and democratic India required the substitution of the economic power of a few rich individuals by a form of state control that could end poverty, reduce unemployment, and improve material conditions. But that state power was not to be devolved away from the individual's rights. In fact, it's striking that the Constituent Assembly rejected separate electorates, which had been there under the British. It also rejected weighted representation. It rejected explicitly reservations on the basis of religion. These were all discussed in the Constituent Assembly. Only days before Indian independence, Sardar Patel, in his capacity as chairman of the Advisory Committee on Minorities and Fundamental Rights of the Constituent Assembly, wrote to its president, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, the president of the assembly, to explain why separate electorates and religious representation had been rejected. Differentiated citizenship on the basis of religion, Patel argued, had already been tried in the colonial era and had led to partition. The answer lay in moving away from a representative framework that recognized identities that were regarded as stable and fixed, and toward a model of citizenship centered on the political participation of individuals. Such a model would allow the categories of majority and minority 
to be constantly defined and redefined within the fluid domain of politics, and that would offer India the greatest form of security. Now, this fundamental issue is what's haunting our politics today. The nationalist movement was divided between two sets of ideas, held by those on the one hand who saw religion as a determinant of their nationhood, and those who believed in an inclusive India for everyone irrespective of faiths, where rights were granted to individuals rather than to religious communities. The former, the idea that religion is a determinant of nationhood, was the idea of Pakistan. The latter was the idea of India. Pakistan was created as a state with a dominant religion, a state that discriminates legally against its minorities and denies them equal rights. To this day, a Pakistani citizen who is not deemed to be a Muslim has stamped on his passport the phrase non-Muslim. On the passport, if he has to go anywhere, rather like the yellow star of David the Jews had to wear in, in Nazi-occupied Denmark. But India never accepted the logic that had partitioned the country. Our freedom struggle was for all, and newly independent India, under the rule of law, was meant to be for all. And this is essentially the, the huge challenge. It's particularly striking in the context of today that the constitution makers explicitly rejected the notion of religion playing any role in citizenship, arguing that each individual voter exercised agency in the democratic project and should not be reduced to the pre-existing loyalties of religious affiliation. For India's founders, one could not be a political agent unless one's political identity was self-created. The Constitution guaranteed and granted representation not to one's predetermined identity, which is what religion gives you, right? You're born into it, or you convert into it. For the most part, you're born into it, and that's a predetermined identity. But instead, the Constitution grants primacy to your individual expression of agency. That's why the individual vote was so important. Democratic politics cannot be reduced to the advocacy of preset interests. Interests instead had to be expressed through politics. The very constitution of one's identity as a citizen, as Mother Kosala has explained, was itself a form of freedom. And the adaptability of the constitution to the ever-changing realities of national life has effectively made it an effective vehicle of social change in our country. Uh, the parliament has in many ways facilitated uh, this change. The constitution was created as a self-generating and self-correcting entity, a living document that allowed for its own amendment to meet the changes of the times, subject, of course, as Justice Cole will remind me, to the doctrine of the basic structure, which, of course, is an invention of the judiciary. It's not a phrase you find in the, in the, in the constitution. But it reflects in many ways the confidence of the founding fathers and mothers that Indians of future generations would be capable of making adjustments and meeting every new challenge. And that's why, of course, 100 amendments have been made since 1950 um, by the parliament created inter alia for that purpose by the constitution. Some may consider this to be a weakness that it needed so much amendment, but I think that's a small-minded approach. One could argue it's actually a sign of its inherent strength, a strength that derives from its ability to be flexible without the risk of self-destruction. And that, I think, is, is in many, many ways the great strength of the way in which the Constitution has worked in India. We have deepened and strengthened in many ways. I do believe the judiciary has made a very valuable contribution uh, in this regard. Um, uh, the, during the emergency, we had the 42nd Amendment, uh, which also brought in the two uh, words, socialist and secular, formally into the Constitution. Uh, and, and the argument can be made that the idea of India is inseparable from these words, though the words themselves did not need to be used because the ideas are embedded in the Constitution themselves. But because they're so fundamental, no subsequent government has chosen to undo them. And various amendments to the Constitution, I'm sure the lawyers here have their own favorites, the 23rd, the 45th, the 55th, the 51st, and many others have tried to make the idea of India more inclusive by bringing more vulnerable sections into the mainstream. Activist judges have taken the Constitution uh, beyond the strict reading of the, of the laws to promote human rights and welfare in a series of landmark judgments. Um, 
education to all Indian children uh, with the landmark 86th Amendment, uh, the Right to Education Act, as it's called, the Right to Information Act in 2005, where accountability became enshrined as part of the legal framework and so on. One can go on and on and on, and I will not do so, though I will argue um, by echoing our former president, uh, Pranab Mukherjee, that the Victorian era penal code <coughs> drafted by Macaulay without consulting any Indians in 1837, enacted by the British a generation later in 1861, is full of iniquities that undermine the quality of the rule of law in our country and is ripe for amendment if not overhaul. I think many of us admire the Supreme Court for having struck down or read down the pernicious section 377, which discriminated against a section of our society for their sexual orientation. There are other elements in the penal code that embody uh, offensive gender bias against women. And of course, there is a sedition law, uh, which despite the Supreme Court having interpreted it consistently since 1962, because it's on the books, is still routinely misapplied and abused at lower levels of our judicial system until eventually <coughs> it reaches a level where it gets, where it gets um, scrapped. Uh, civil society has played a role in affecting um, in affecting the, um, the, uh, uh, the legal structure, the rule of law. We've seen the Anna Hazare movement resulting in the Lokpal, which suggests that in fact, all sorts of changes can have a bearing upon the creation of the idea of India uh, through uh, the rule of law. Um, I, do, I do want to add a couple of thoughts uh, before we, we wrap this up. Laws emerge from a political process that is itself reflective of our society. Parliament, parliamentarians are themselves products of civil society. Our democracy, our thriving free media, our contentious civil society forums, our energetic human rights groups, and the repeated spectacle of our remarkable general elections have all made India a rare example of the successful management of diversity in the developing world. It adds to India's soft power and influence in the world when our non-governmental organizations actively defend human rights, promote environmentalism, fight injustice. It's a vital asset for the country when the Indian press is free, lively, irreverent, disdainful of sacred cows, rather than the cowed down institution it has so often become. Because all of these actually work together to promote and expand the idea of India for the, for the citizens of India and for people outside. At the same time, a new and disturbing tendency has arisen in our times of the free press intruding upon the prospects of justice by conducting trial by media in a number of sensationalized cases. Well, I'm the last person who'd wish to place any restrictions on press freedom, of which I've been a staunch advocate all my life, despite being a victim of it too. I'm troubled by the large number of recent instances in which the press, in addition to playing the role of witness and observer, which it must, has also appointed itself prosecutor, judge, jury, and even executioner. I raise the question not because I have any answers to offer, but because I believe all of us in this room must be aware of this new tendency and conscious of its dangers for our democratic and constitutional system. After all, judges are also members of our society and are exposed to our media. Despite their undoubted judicial rectitude, it's difficult to imagine they are completely uninfluenced by the media they consume daily. But the fairness of the trial that results is the real question we have to address. And then there is a threat that we have um, seen to the idea, to law and the idea of India from the disturbing developments of recent years. Mob rule, vigilantism, and lynchings. When these occur, they undermine both the sanctity of the law as the ultimate arbiter of justice, and also faith in the law as a cement that binds the idea of India together. It is vital that we assert, reassert the primacy of law by bringing these self-appointed upholders of justice to justice, bring them to book, bring them to justice to teach them the importance of subordinating their self-righteousness to the majesty of the law. This is not the occasion 
to enter into politics, particularly in the presence of a Supreme Court judge. But I would be remiss if I concluded my lecture without addressing briefly the elephant in the room, the current challenge to the idea of India from a law, the Citizenship Amendment Act. Since the constitutionality of the law is before the Supreme Court, I will not enter into the merits of it here, much though I'm sorely tempted to do so. But it is without question the first law to question the fundamental underpinning of the idea of India I've described, that religion is not the determinant of our nationhood and therefore of our citizenship. Anxiety about the implications of this law has already created an increase in tensions and an, ex and an eruption of violence that has claimed 56 lives in the nation's capital as of today and left hundreds injured. It has also injured the idea of India as an inclusive state which honors the equality of all and guarantees that the state will not practice religious discrimination between minorities and majorities. In fact, let me turn again to that great speech of Ambedkar on November 4th, 1948 on the subject. And I quote, to diehards who have developed a kind of fanaticism against minority protection. I would like to say two things. One is that minorities are an explosive force, which if it erupts can blow up the whole fabric of the state. The history of Europe bears ample and appalling testimony to this fact. The other is that the minorities in India have agreed to place their existence in the hands of the majority. They have loyally accepted the rule of the majority, which is basically a communal majority and not a political majority. It is for the majority to realize its duty not to discriminate against minorities. Unquote, Dr. Ambedkar, 1948. Today, I'm sorry to say that India is in the grip of the very majoritarianism that Dr. Ambedkar had so presciently warned against. Our Prime Minister's great hero, Sadar Patel, had urged in the Constituent Assembly on May 25, 1949, quote, it is for us who happen to be in a majority to think about what the majorities feel and how we in their position would feel if we are treated in the manner they are treated. Unquote, Sadar Patel, 1949. Given the government's oft expressed admiration for the likes of Dr. Ambedkar and Sardar Patel, one can only hope <clears throat> they will abandon their current approach that reduces individuals to their religious affiliations and denies them their agency as free citizens of our democratic republic. Of course, it is for the highest court in the land to rule on whether this legislation honors the letter of the constitution but many of us feel strongly already that it violates the spirit, the spirit that animates it, the spirit that is the very idea of India. Thank you very much, and Jayan.